Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Lots of space fans know about the Apollo Guidance Computer. I myself have talked about this historic device, its famous errors during Apollo 11. I've disassembled the code and even had the chance to look inside a real one. But fewer of you know that there were actually four different computers on every Apollo mission to the moon, all with different roles and designs. The four computers were the Launch Vehicle Digital Computer, on the Saturn V, which handled the launch of the monster rocket. There was the Apollo guidance computer in the command module that handled the, handled the deep space navigation needs, and there was a second Apollo guidance computer in the lunar module, which would handle landing on the moon, the return to orbit, and rendezvous with the command module. Then there was the abort system in the lunar module, which was a backup system that would handle a return to lunar orbit if primary guidance failed. So there were three distinct designs developed and built by three different teams and three and a half sets of software since the AGC code for command module and lunar module actually shared a lot in common. And you know, being a bit of a computer nerd, I want to talk to you about how all these were unique technological creations in their own way. So let's start with the launch vehicle digital computer. That was developed by IBM to control the Saturn 1B and the Saturn V. It was part of the instrument unit fitted to the final S4B stage. This unit also included the power, cooling, communications and sensors required for the entire guidance system. The digital computer itself weighed about 36 kilograms and fit into a box about 75 centimeters by 32 by 27. The logic hardware was built out of individual transistors and diodes. These came in tiny half millimeter chips, which would be soldered onto one centimeter square alumina chips. And these in turn would then be soldered onto an eight by cent eight, six centimeter PCB. This kind of packaging was something that IBM had developed experience with for their more earthbound mainframe computers. The computer used magnetic core memory, which came in 4096 word modules, and there would be up to eight of these modules that could be fitted to store the program and the working memory, providing a total or a theoretical total of 32,768 words of storage. There wasn't any read-only memory. The program was loaded into memory and could be modified during vehicle assembly. The computer clock cycle operated at 2048 kHz, but the processor would take about 168 cycles to execute most instructions because it's operating one bit at a time. So it'll run about 12,000 instructions per second. But it also had triply redundant hardware, so each operation was also performed by three separate units and the most popular answer was chosen to guard against failures. There were two arithmetic units. One would perform your basic addition, subtraction, logical operators in a single cycle, while the other would handle the more complicated multiplication in four cycles or division in eight. But the two units operated independently, so one instruction might start a division and then spend the eight, nine, next eight cycles doing something else before coming back and retrieving the result. The computer operated on 28-bit words, but each word was split into two 14-bit syllables, and one of those bits in each syllable was a parity bit for error checking. Now, an instruction could be encoded with a 4-bit opcode and a 9-bit operand, so you'd put two instructions in each word of memory. Numerical data would instead be stored in 26 bits across both syllables as two's complement integers. The computer had two memory modes which could be used for, by programs. It could be used in simplex or duplex mode, with duplex mode essentially providing redundancy by performing each read and write operation onto two memory banks. Since the instructions only had 9-bit operands for addressing, that meant you could only address 512 uh, words of memory. To cover the entire memory range, the hardware had to use a complicated bank switching system, which made it hard to pass lots of data between programs running on different memory modules. In particular, this meant that some code had to be replicated on each memory module for performance reasons. Well, at least that's what the team at MIT told NASA, because 
Early on in the development, our IBM argued that the Apollo guidance computer shouldn't even be built and they should use their LVDC instead. And they produced substantial reports which the MIT team responded to with a detailed report of their own. And as far as we know, this is the only document which includes examples of how you wrote code for the launch vehicle digital computer. IBM have never really released any uh, documentation and there's not really any dumps of the code that ran on the LVDC. But, you know, hypothetically, you might be able to retrieve it from the memory of the LVDC in the National Air and Space Museum if they'd let a hacker near it. Finally, that digital computer is assisted by a second analog computer. The flight control computer was an essential part because it would take the commands from the digital computer and it would translate those into the engine control commands, the gimballing. Uh, this was needed because the digital computer was too slow to deal with the real-time operation of the rocket and had to have the analog computer uh, perform the fine adjustments to the uh, engines to keep it straight. So the computer would tell it which way to point and the flight computer would make sure that it stayed pointing in that direction. So let's go on to the AGC. There were two of these in the Apollo spacecraft and they're the highest profile of the devices, the, the computers that were up there. When people say the Apollo computers, this is what they typically mean. Unlike the LVDC, we have complete working code. We even have working hardware thanks to some amazing hardware hackers. The AGC is so well documented that there are emulators you can play with on simulators which use the real code. And actually you can use it inside Kerbal Space Program if you really want to. The AGC was developed by Draper and they used integrated circuits for compactness. The Block 2 computer which was used on the crewed flights had its core logic implemented in 2,800 integrated circuits. Each of these had a pair of three input NOR gates uh, implemented in transistor-transistor logic. The clock speed was again 2048 kilohertz, but the memory cycle time was only 11.7 microseconds and the instructions took between one and six cycles to complete. So overall, the AGC was significantly faster than the LVDC. The memory used 16-bit words, but one of those bits was reserved for parity. With one instruction per word, uh, numerical values were reserved a single sign bit, but were ones complemented. Uh, unlike most computers these days, which use two, two's complement. Instructions were originally supposed to take one word of memory, but as the computer got more and more complicated, they ended up adding instructions that took two uh, chunks of two words of memory. The memory itself was split between 2048 words of erasable core memory, that's RAM, and 36864 words of rope memory, which had to be hardwired in a factory and couldn't be changed at that point. Uh, the AGC also still needed to use memory bank switching to address all the memory, and this was more complicated in some ways than the LVDC, but actually ultimately it worked out to be faster and more efficient than the LVDC's implementation. Unlike the LVDC, there wasn't any redundancy. The AGC had a single core and its approach to reliability was to make rollback and recovery from any error very fast. And this was seen in Apollo 11. When those alarms are going off, the computer is resetting and restarting and picking up where it left off almost instantly. The astronauts would interface to the computer with the disky interface. And this, of course, had the famous verb commands and the big displays. When a lot of people point at the computer, that's what they see. But the actual computer was typically, uh, if it was a, in, elsewhere in the spacecraft, I think on the lunar module, it was on the wall behind them in a sealed box that was 60 centimeter by 31 by 15 centimeters. And the whole thing massed about 32 kilograms. Now, the main difference between the command module co uh, AGC and the lunar module AGC was the code on those rope memory modules. For the crewed Apollo missions, the command module code was called Colossus and the lunar module code was called Luminary. But there were a bunch of other versions named. Uh, notably, the first code flown on an Apollo spacecraft was called Corona. Later, later versions for Colossus um, were known as Artemis, and the final versions of the AGC software on Skylab were known as Skylark. 
So the AGCs don't have redundancy. They have this rapid restart and resume capability, but just in case something disastrous happened, the lunar module carried a second computer to handle emergency situations. The abort guidance system was originally called the backup guidance system, or BUGS. But this was seen as asking for trouble amongst a superstitious bunch of engineers, so it became AGS. It was developed and built by TRW, and they again came up with their own architecture. Most of the logic was built out of a library of eight types of integrated circuits using diode transistor logic. It used 18-bit words with no parity bit. Instructions were five instruction bits and an index bit and 12 address bits, allowing it to access a flat four kilowords of memory. The memory was all ferrite core with half of it considered erasable and half of it read only, but this was really only, uh, the, it was still using core memory, it was just the ability to overwrite the memory was inhibited. Many of the instructions took about 10 microseconds to operate, so it was about the same speed as the AG, AGC, and you know, divide, divide could take as much as 70 microseconds. And interestingly, of the 27 instructions that were implemented, there were four that were specified that intentionally omitted the memory refresh, and that would leave the memory as a zeros, but it would save power. And programmers were told to use this to reduce the power uh, you know, load on the system. Astronauts would interface with the abort guidance system using the DIDA, the Data Entry Display Adapter, which was a cruder version of the Disky in essence, you could use it to display contents of memory in specific locations or to set values. Uh, with only 4K of data to work with, it was missing many of the features that the Apollo guidance computer had, but it had enough smarts to put the lunar module in a safe orbit and then rendezvous back with the command module. The AGS was never needed for a full lunar module abort, but it did find use a couple of times during the missions. On Apollo 13, it was used to keep the vehicle stable during the short burns used to trim the entry angle. Uh, the AGS used a lot less power than the AGC, so it was the better option. And on Apollo 11, during the final rendezvous and docking maneuver, Neil performed a, a rotation which pushed the inertial platform on the primary guidance system into gimbal lock. Now, the AGS had its own uh, simpler strap-down like gyro system, and it didn't suffer from gimbal lock. So that was used to keep the L lunar module controllable during the final docking. And in case you're wondering, the strap-down system was easier, smaller, comp more compact, but it drifted more over time. So the primary guidance system with its you know, fancy gimbals was better for long period uh, stability. The truth is the abort guidance system didn't get used very much because the Apollo guidance computer was so reliable. Even without redundancy in the processor or the memory, it never had any serious in-flight failures due to hardware. And it doesn't help that the Apollo 13 movie writes the AGS out of the script entirely. But as a hardcore computer nerd, I find all these different approaches and implementations fascinating. Back then, these designers couldn't even agree on how many bits should be in a word. And yet they all worked together to put people on the surface of the moon and bring them home. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.